Welcome to the Got Invention Show. I'm your host, Brian Freed, and tonight we have Kimberly Kirkham. She is an inventor with a very interesting story, great person, all kinds of inventions, a lot of fun things to share with us tonight. Kimberly, welcome to the show. Hi, Brian. How are you? Doing good. Thanks for joining us. Uh, thank you for having me. So, Kimberly, tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us who you are, where you're from, and then we'll start getting into a little bit more of why you're here, which is you have several inventions that you've been working on. So first start off by telling us who you are. Okay, uh, I'm Kimberly Kirkup. I live here on Long Island, New York. I born and raised here, and I am a nurse at a local hospital, Stony Brook Hospital, and I work with children in the child psychiatry. Very interesting. And so you are always seeing patients, you're seeing how there's problems and there's solutions. So do you feel like you've always been an inventor or what, what kind of triggered the inventor side of you? You know, I, I always, I never knew I was an inventor, like I had that type of personality. And looking back at the point that I ended up having that spark, which honestly would have been having my son and him having special needs that caused me to start making things because of what I saw happened in him, which also then made me end up going into child psychiatry as well. But then when I look back at my growth as a person, I realized I've always had that ability to either change or manipulate something and make it better or create something from scratch. I just didn't know it and I didn't know how to channel it. Does that make sense? It does. And so you started to realize that you were coming up with ideas that might not just be for you. It could be for other people who might be sharing the same challenges that you had. So, yeah. or, or you may have, and so tell us like, what was the point where you started to really take your ideas more seriously? It was, um, it, it first started with mostly child um, products and everything. But what really made me get more momentum was, is, and, and a lot of inventors will probably attest to the same thing. It's like your brain doesn't shut off. It just keeps taking things and looking at it and, and you be in a story and you say, you know what, I, that's a good idea, but if it just did this or I had this increased functionality or if it if they maybe, you know, functionally changed this, it would work better, you know? And I started to do that a lot. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, and I was like, and at that point, I said, you know, I, I really should try to do something with this because my brain isn't letting me not do it. You, you know, so, it kept going. So what did you do? So you were at that point where you're like, I got to do something. What was the first thing you did? Um, as far as product, you mean? Just in or general, like, like, how did you... So you wanted to start working on these ideas. What did you do? Did you write them down? Did you start sketching them out? Like that okay. part. <laughs> Back to the primordial ooze phase. <laughs> <laughs> the aha moment. Yes. I did. I started writing them down, but I'm horribly unorganized. So I, I ended up getting a book, but then I, I found myself writing stuff on little pieces of paper, then sticking them in the book. So I ended up having a file cabinet, which for me was the best thing. And then I would kind of organize everything in, in there and, and put my ideas there. But I didn't, back then they didn't really have a go-to person to try and help you, um, you know, get, your things out into the world and license and stuff. It wasn't a big thing. We're talking about, let me think, about 15 years ago. Okay. I mean, some places that did it, but it there wasn't a, um, it, it, it wasn't really pro inventor back then, mm -hmm. you know? So it was a lot of trying to do it all on your own. And that was very difficult, especially when it came to manufacturing of anything and trying to get um, networking of people. They just didn't have the channel back then. So for me, it was a lot of hunting and searching, um, learning how to do patent searches on my own, 
Um, and then also, you know, the big thing was looking to find my invention as opposed to looking to not find my invention in in the uh, patent world, you know, because okay. you, you know what I mean? Because a, a lot of times you're looking and you're just thinking, you know, oh, I don't want to see my idea there. And you're kind of like <laughs> a voice, you, you know, I, I was like, yes. Yeah, and in the army, I was like a researcher. So my big thing was, is I was like searching, 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 and so that's why I originally started out. But it was it was hard. It, it was very hard to get um, to that point where you um, you felt like everything was going in the right direction. And I don't think I ever really fully got there. Even even today, I don't think I've fully gotten to that place yet. I, but I'm I have a lot more mindfulness as far as um the things that i've done wrong and how i could probably you know make it better but i, I still have a lot of work <laughs> <laughs> all right so very interesting i guess you have been an inventor for quite some time then because you were talking about kind of like back in the day they didn't really have the resources like you have today with even just 3D printers and, you know, I, I've gotten a chance to know you for a long time, Kimberly. So it's really been kind of like a real, almost like just a whole phase and next generation of the way that an inventor can really make things happen today. So when you started to come up with the idea, so let's talk about your first one, Kimberly. So you had that moment where you really felt like there was a problem you came up with the solution. Tell us what the problem was, and then tell us what you came up with. Um, one of the first ideas that I had was um, my son was getting into everything, and it was a like a, a cover for a toilet uh, lever because one day my son threw a kazoo into the toilet, and I at the time I was. Um, mobilized in the army and I was living in an apartment building and I was thinking holy Christmas tree this is gonna block <laughs> up everything it's gonna be a disaster it turned out to not be that bad but it was the whole idea of they always throw it just at that right moment where you're like getting ready to close it and then they're like <laughs> <laughs> you know they, they chuck in the toilet and you're like no so it was that moment and I was like, if there was some way that you could cover the handle to where it, it, you're kind of changing behavior, part of what you're doing with an invention too, you, you know? So the propensity is to leave a toilet seat open. If you have the handle covered to flush it, right? But the seat is pinching it, you're just gonna have to close that seat first and then you can open up this cover. So you're trying to change the order um, and how people are doing things without them really knowing it. So that was the the idea of this invention was to do that, to prevent the flushing action before the toilet seat was closed. And okay. then you so right. kind of just mental, you know, making people do it in a certain order that would benefit and not cause the incident to happen with me. Got it. So tonight, you want to show us two that you came up with, which is the Spyro tab and also mm -hmm. the baby spoon, the play and learn. So with the play and learn, the baby spoon, tell us why you came up with that. And let's take a look and see what you actually came up with. So why don't you uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about why you came up with it? OK, um, here is the play and learn baby spoon. The reason why I came up with this um, toy slash learning device for um, infants was my my son is autistic, and any type of tool use for him was was delayed. He didn't use a fork or a spoon until he was around between four and five years old. And the whole aspect of balancing food on a spoon there's it's a very three dimensional concept using a spoon. The first thing that infants have a tendency to do is they want to grab any type of thing and jam it in their mouth. So I made guards on it to prevent it so that they didn't get a negative association with this tool or toy. It's very flexible. So it also ends up um, 
not hurting them. And it's teethable. So they actually want to continue playing with this. And the bigger aspect of this is it has spoon-like functionality. So that then they're also learning to use a spoon without the negative association, such as sometimes they'll stick the spoon too far in their mouth, they'll turn it around and they're sticking the shaft in their mouth, which is a very popular thing that infants like to do. Because um, in I looked in scientific literature um, that was looking at tool use in infants. And one of the big things that they did was stick the, the handle in their mouth. So by having a scoop on either end with a guard, it's preventing that action from happening. And I got very positive results with this spoon. I also had a lot of um, PT and OT, uh, physical therapists and occupational therapists who liked it. And actually a lady who had parrots. The parrots apparently like to use tools too, and they love playing with items similarly. So I thought that was a little bit interesting too. But of course, I made this more for kids, <laughs> not <laughs> parrots. <laughs> well, that's a, very interesting. So it's actually, it's a a toy and they can actually use it to feed whether they're lefty righty whichever hand they take and there's also an area there so it goes in but it's not going to choke them or there's no hazard i'm sure you had to figure all that out so very interesting yeah. so kimberly when you first came up with the idea what did you do you searched there was no place for prototypes back then, you know? So what I did was I went to like a Michaels and I got moldable clay and I started toying with the clay. And it, the first iteration of this looked very different. It was more like it fit in the whole hand and there was like a little goopy thing sticking out. And then it kind of morphed into this. And I happened to find um, a man who was an industrial designer in an invention group who did this as his side, not his side, it was like his main hustle was helping people, you know, kind of bring their ideas to life. And he also was into prototyping too. So he's the one who helped me make these initially. And okay. then after that, he was taking that idea to then manufacture. But to design it, like, is that what you thought? it was going to look like when you first started, when you made it out of clay? No, it looked very, very different. It was, it almost had like a big, huge area that was like a handle that like was con arced to the hand. And then it had like a little, little scoop on it. It looked totally different. But then I realized that I need to make it look as spoon-like as possible to have them morph into using a spoon because it's all about them learning these little aspects of the 3D motions of tool use. So one is just being able to get it from over here to the mouth, right? That's the one thing. This, the second phase of it is then learning how to actually balance it with the food. So if you can break it down into steps for them without them knowing it through play, that's where they really end up learning because they don't know that they're doing that, you know, and you're a parent, you have to be very covert in how you, you, you know, address them and whether, whatever you can use in your arsenal, that's what you got to do. So learning through play is one of the biggest things that we can do. Okay. So when you designed it, you started to search to see if there was something similar out there that you came up with? Yes. And there wasn't anything. Mm -hmm. they, had, they had spoons, but they were all hard. You know, there were some that were um, a little bit flexible, but they didn't have a guard. Um, a lot of times back then, it was like we gave our kids the wooden spoons and everything to play with, or they would take the the pots and pans out of the cabinet and they would bang everything all over the place. <laughs> um, so yeah, there wasn't anything like it. And also it 
there was a safety function too that wasn't there. A lot of spoons are advertised as being safe, but when you really think about it, without the guard and it not being a choking hazard, a spoon technically is not a safe utensil. A normal spoon, hmm. well, from a safety hazard point, is not considered safe for infants. So it sounds like you, while you were doing your research, you realized that there were some things, safety issues, you had to deal with kind of like the child type of getting involved uh, type of, uh, you know, if there's regulations or if there has to be a certain way that is not going to be a choking hazard in parts, right? And back at this time that I was making this, it also was when uh, BPA was big and they didn't put it within the regulations of having a certain uh, parts per million it wasn't part of their parameters yet. So what mm. I was having to do ahead of time, because it was going to come down the road, you know, within the year, I had to make sure that any type of safety testing I did for this complied with those even before it came out. Okay. So that's the other thing that I had to deal with. So you did your search. You had the engineer make it for you. Well, you made it out of clay first. Then you had your engineer do it. Then you made a prototype. What'd you do after that? After I did the prototype, it was about trying to find a place that could manufacture it and using the material that I wanted because it's it's called it's a thermoplastic elastomer, so it's a, it has a certain flexibility. Um, they call it a gerometer. You know the the flexibility of it. And it was trying to find a place that had that. And that was a little bit difficult. I eventually found it and I found the material that I wanted, which Gerber was using it in a spoon of theirs. So then it was me trying to narrow down and find out who had the raw material for it and then having a place that could injection mold it. So you were all in at this point, you just, you expected to manufacture it you wanted to make them and start selling them yourself yes i did okay and did you file any patent applications at any point and what's your status on it now i started to file a patent and i actually did but then what ended up happening was i i was going into a light i had switched from doing it all on my own to then saying okay i, I had a big company who was interested in it and um, it, it, that's when you don't have experience with that, it's a bit daunting and you don't really know the right things to say. That's when you really need to have somebody with a little bit of experience because I had none. But um, they ended up making a version of the spoon. And at that point, I ended up stop selling, selling my version because they had um, a bigger distribution network than I did. And I was kind of in like the brick and mortars. I wasn't in like a Toys R Us. Um, it was more of like the um, boutique type stores. Okay. So they had, uh, so you were manufacturing it and then yep. they ended up finding you or you found them. You ended up licensing it. So you were earning royalties from it. No, I I never got royalties. Basically, they they did a knockoff of it. Okay. I never got anything. So oh. at that point, that I stopped. So they did it without you, or they they did it without me. Okay. And did you have a patent? Did you have any intellectual property protection? At that point, I did. I had a patent, and then it, um. This is why probably one of the best things I could tell anybody is, is don't let people see your patent because if it's not fully published yet, because I let them see my patent and then they worked around it is what they did. So um, at that point, um, then I just didn't reinitiate it because I, I thought if someone's going to work around it, then what's the point? And I kind of got pretty bummed after that. So... Okay. So what are you doing with the, with your invention now? Um, well, my, my hopes that someone would want to license it and use it because it really, it's still, to me, it's a very good product. It does help. And everybody, because I still have 
a bunch of spoons, I, I give them away to friends and stuff. And they're like, oh, wow, this is awesome. And they love the spoon. It's just I haven't. I haven't manufactured them because it was just a lot of energy that I just don't have anymore. Not that I don't have energy for it. It's just, I don't have the time for it with going to school and working and everything. So it would be better for someone else to take the reins on it. And you have a fully issued utility patent or design patent on it? Um, I don't have either actually. Okay. It, it's more that because I, I let the patent go from that point that the, um, when, when the people had done their own version of it. So mm -hmm. I just let it go. Okay. So it's kind of in public domain at this point. Exactly. Okay. All right. So lesson learned there, Kimberly. So the next one you came up with was the Spiro tab. So yes. this one is patent pending? Yes, patent pending. Okay. So tell us why you came up with this and show us. Show us what you have. So this is called the Spiro tab, and what it is, it, there's three versions of it. It's a device that can go into the spiral, as you can see, for labeling of spiral type media, but also with the different versions, like this one I call the Spiro tab Flex. It's very flexible. It's made out of a material that um, a Petaflex folder tab would be made out of. But the cool thing is, is that it goes in and out easily, but it also can then fit into a Peniflex folder. So it can be used in both places. So that um, it has like a cutout in the bottom so that it can fit in. And that's the one version. Then there's the SpiroTab Kids Tough version, which is made out of plastic. And with that one, I have to I put this one down. It, um, they come, they go in and out very easily. They have little tabs on the side and they stay in. You shift it and it doesn't come out at all. And it's very, very resilient. This would be perfect for like um, kids um, books, whether it's um, in a locker or in their book bag, it won't come off and actually can fold over like this, see? So it's pretty good. And then the other version, I call it the Spiro Tab Elite. And this version can be engravable to where you can have a nice, neat look and they also have that ease of going in and out. And it, you can see kind of with this one where there's versions of it where they're engraved either in um, script or just regular and they can have like the little opening here for a little bit more of a grasp. The plastic one, hard to see, but it has like little nubs here that are grabbable so that you can pull it if say it's sandwiched between books in, in a wall locker or um, in a book bag. Well, so why did you come up with this? Um, I came up with this because I actually, I don't, you end up buying spiral notebooks because you, you know, they're there and you need this type of, of media for school or what have you. And I don't like the way that they look on, on a bookshelf. And half the time you're pulling it out to see, oh, is this the book that I need? Is, you know, you label it, but it's still not ideal for me. I'd rather be able to have that indexing capability that the Spiro tab offers. And I can look and say, okay, that's what I need and get it instead of me wasting time searching on a bookshelf for what I need. Wow. So are there any other types of ideas like this to be able to put something into the spiral part of a notebook? No, there is not. They have all these other things for this part of the book, but not for the spiral part. Very interesting. So when you figured that this was a problem that you realized like, hey, I have a stack of notebooks. I don't know what's what. I mean, I'm trying to remember the colors, what's in it. So now I have these tabs on the outside. So when you came up with it, what did you do? Um, the first thing that I did was I, th this was more recent. So the ability to have people help you was a little bit more available. So it was actually through your group. Um, a local who is associated with Farmingdale. 
and he um, was into manufacturing and I had him help me do the designing of it. And then he was able to use a 3D printer to make a prototype of the plastic version that you see here, as you can see the little nubs on the edge right there. And then as I was thinking of it more, I have a laser machine and I was, and I thought, you know, I could also make a variation of this too. So in between me having my machinery and what I have and using other um, machines, I was able to kind of make my own like various versions. And then when I was at the, um, like a Staples, I was looking at the Penaflex folders. I was like, you know what? I could take that and I, all I have to do is do this and it would also be another variation. So then it's a line that I created at the same time. They didn't know it at the time. And then it kind of I was like, oh my God. So. Well, it seems like it's very practical. It seems like you were in Staples, it should be on the shelf. So what have you done so far, Kimberly? You're looking to license this, you're looking to manufacture it. Um, I'm looking to license it. I think that especially for the Penaflex version, it would be um, very easy for a company to manufacture. Actually, all versions would be very, very easy to manufacture and then establish a line, which I, a lot of companies uh, would want to do as opposed to having just one thing. Okay. So you came up with the idea. You found somebody to help you in the inventors group to kind of design what you were envisioning to make sure that those little hooks are underneath the spiral. I mean, you were pulling on it and it seemed like it wasn't coming out. So it looks like it's in there pretty well. Did you have to go through a few versions to really make sure that it stuck, that it, that it, that it fit in properly? Yes, I, I did actually. I, um, I had one version where it was just like one long piece that wasn't efficient, you know, it has to get threaded through, that wasn't good. Then another version where the hooks were bigger, you're thinking bigger, better, no. <laughs> and then um, with this version where, even though the little tabs are tiny, I'll show you, they really it, grip it, in, they, they're not that big. Like and it seems like even when when you're like going through this, you have to be really patient. Will you? It's like it seems like such a simple idea, but it's almost like were you getting frustrated with all the different versions that you were getting involved with? I was, I because this was about. I'm trying to think. It was about the fifth or sixth version. Wow. So That's at least it was better than another one. So, but yeah, and and then I finally narrowed it down, and um, so yeah, it was a little bit frustrating because I was like, oh my god, this little thing, and it's taking so long. Mm. <laughs> you know? But look at it now. Yeah, look at it now. I know. I'm, I'm happy with it. I'm happy how it came out. It, it and it wedges between the metal, so it just kind of sits there. It it. I'm I'm proud of my product. <laughs> and it seems like it was easier this time than the first time. And you did your due diligence. You did your research. Um, you ended up doing a search. So you have a chance to hopefully get the intellectual property. So you're patent pending right now with a provisional patent application. Or did you file the full patent? I did provisional patent application. Okay. So provisional application. And then you'll convert it into the non-provisional, which is the utility. And then... What you're going to do is you're going to start showing it to companies that are in that industry of accessories for notebooks or notebook companies, right? What what have you done so far? Um, basically, I've just, for that phase, I've just gone through and tallied up who are the companies that would be in this venue. I haven't contacted anybody yet, but um, I have the list and um, basically I've, sorry, my computer. So, oh, that's okay. So I, I had a, a list, but I haven't contacted anybody yet, but it's basically okay. narrowing down and seeing who's in this industry. And then from there, contacting them. Great, well, you did a great job to this point and uh, we wish you all the best with, uh, with the Spirotab. You definitely learned some lessons along the way with the other ones, but this one, hopefully is is the one. And uh, it's something where you're looking for a company that manufactures uh, those type of accessories. So they'll manufacture it, they'll distribute it, 
and hopefully you'll be earning a royalty from it very soon. So congratulations on where you are at this point to perfecting it. Excellent. Huh. Well, it was with your help too, so you helped me <laughs> So Kimberly, there's inventors that are listening at all stages. They, they've either started or they've might've, they might've gone through your type of journey, or maybe they're just going through their own journey in, in a different direction, a different way. If you can help to give some words of wisdom to the inventors listening, no matter what stage they're at, tell us just from your experience as an inventor, tell us how to, how can you help us just in general, like give us some tips and tricks and what we should do to keep our ideas moving forward. Okay. I, I know that for me, part of my issue is, is I think of so many things and then it's hard for me to uh, boil it down to focusing in on one thing. And I would probably tell them, all of them sound probably great and wonderful, but work on one, two things at a time so that then you're not being like buckshot all over the place and then you don't get anywhere with anything. That, that would be one. The other one would be, there's no point spinning your wheel on something and you're doing all of this work to then find out that somebody else has a patent on it. So your due diligence, most importantly, is to look for the patent and you want to find it. You want to look to find, not look to not see, <laughs> you know, and because then you'll be spending all of this money on something that's already out there. Um, then as far as designing, sometimes it takes a long time to really get it to that nuanced piece of work that you're saying, wow, this is it. And even like thinking of a name. And at that point, you know, you want to get other people's views on it to kind of help you troubleshoot it and make it more functional. Because sometimes I find that for myself, I think that I'm thinking in the right way of how something works and is operational. And then someone will say, oh no, I use it like this. And I'm like, oh really? Cause you know, I had no idea that you could use, you know, you know what I mean? So having input from other people and also going to the inventors groups really helped as well because I didn't have certain guidance that I needed and experience, especially when it comes down to that you do do the licensing thing. I didn't have someone that I could go to at the time and it didn't go very well for me. Having somebody that has the expertise will save you a lot of anguish. Um, it's not something that you wanna go through or have even someone take your idea. It seems things have changed a lot in the past 15 years where people are very pro, our companies are more pro inventor than what they were back in in the day. And that's really one thing that's going very in the right direction for people like me and you. Whereas before it wasn't, I, I had a friend who had a story about the, the car club and um, this the company that stole the idea was from a young kid and they had already preset in their head that it was um, that they could do that. But companies are so much better now. They don't, it's not like their go-to. Now they want to promote inventing and innovation. And it, it's good to see that change. Hmm. Excellent. Kimberly, thank you so much for being on our show tonight. We really appreciate it. And I'm sure you're going to have plenty other inventions that you're working on because you're one of, you're one of those where you come up with something, you know, you're aware that you're, Things are happening around you. You stop, you write them down, you capture them. And I'm sure there's going to be plenty more great inventions. So really appreciate having you on our show tonight, Kimberly. Oh, thanks, Brian, for having me. I, I appreciate all that you've done for me, as well as um, just how you help all other inventors try and make their dreams come true. It's very, very um, inspiring. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Kimberly. So thank you everybody for joining us on Got Invention Show. If you'd like to be a guest, go to gotinventionshow.com. Thank you for joining. Have a great night.